Perfect. Uh, okay. Hey, folks. So listen, uh, we've got about an hour planned for you, about 56 minutes or so. Um, a couple thoughts here. First and foremost, um, I am going to do a short presentation um, focused on the content that's in my new book, Forever Employable. Um, so uh, that's that's going to start off at 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes if I, if I go a little long. So I'll start that in just a second. Um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, and then Dragos and I will go through the, the questions and the questions that you'd like answered. Please, at the bottom of the Zoom interface, there's a button that says Q&A. That's where you should put your questions. If you put them in the chat, we may or may not see them. If you put them in the Q&A box, we absolutely will see them and try to get to as many as we can. Um, we'll record this. It's being recorded, and, and Dragos will share it out um, as well once the... Uh, uh, once the recording is available, which should just be in about an hour or two. So, hey, thanks so much for joining us. It's nice to see folks from all over the world. Um, Paris, Stockholm, Sydney, Kiev, I saw, Singapore, Dubai. I'm in Barcelona, where it's, it's a lovely day uh, that we can enjoy primarily from our balconies. So, uh, not too bad. But here, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to share with you some, some slightly new thinking today about how to apply product thinking to yourself. And to do that, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you and go through a little bit of a presentation with you here and, and walk you through some of the ideas about uh, be, becoming forever employable, which is the, the, the title of my new book. Um, I hope you can see my, uh, the big slides. I'm going to assume that yes, if, if Dragos, if, if for some reason I'm projecting the wrong screen, just pop in and let me know. Otherwise, I'm feeling fairly confident that Okay, no problem. It's the right screen. Okay. We're good. Okay. Hey, you know what? We're all going to be awesome Zoom uh, practitioners. It's going to be like one of those endorsements. I'm going to be like Zoom certified presenter <laughs> at some point. Um, in any case, I want to tell you a story, um, a, a few stories about me and about this idea of becoming forever employable, which is the, the title of my new book. And it's really focused on your product management career and trying to keep it as agile as your work. So if we're working on building these agile teams and these agile products, um, really thinking through um, how to apply that same kind of thinking to, to, to your product management career as well, and kind of any career in general. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you some stories that come from my experience and help illustrate that. So we'll start with this. Um, this is me and these are my kids. Um, uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, basically um, about 12 years ago. And, and, you know, I was living the dream at that point. I was um, in my mid thirties. I was uh, mar I'm married, still married, uh, two kids. They're a lot bigger now uh, these days. Um, uh, they still hug each other like this every now and again. There's a lot more fighting these days. Um, but this is New York City, this is Central Park, and figuring out the parenting thing, and everything was going great. I was, I was working, I had, I, had, I had a job, and then um, on the morning of my 35th birthday, so the day I turned 35, I kind of woke up in this cold sweat and in a bit of a panic on the day that I turned 35, because up until that point, I'd had a pretty good run, you know, I'm, but, you know, from kind of starting off in university and working my way up to the age of 35, I had a pretty good run. I spent a lot of years playing in bands um, in, in high school and in college and, and after college as well. And, you know, I started off as a, as a broke musician. Uh, I was having the best time of my life with some of my best friends, but, you know, not making a whole lot of money, but playing a lot of music and having a lot of fun. And, uh, and then the internet happened right? <laughs> the internet, this amazing thing that happened in the mid 90s, that completely transformed um, how we do everything. And it gave me an opportunity to start doing something else because being a broke musician, as fun as it was, uh, left you broke. <laughs> so I was trying to actually pay my rent and eat and that type of thing. And so um, in the late 90s, if you could spell HTML, uh, you, you could get a job. And I could certainly do more than spell HTML. And so I got a job at this company called IXL, uh, doing graphic design and front-end development. And shortly thereafter, um, became an information architect based on Lou Rosenfeld and Peter Morville's uh, amazing book, which is now in its fourth edition, uh, changed my life. And I've managed to actually tell Peter and Lou over the years how much this book has changed my life and moved things forward. 
And, uh, and that really kind of launched my career into UX and design and other things as well. And everything was going great. And then the dot-com bubble burst, right? Everything kind of fell apart. Uh, uh, you know, all these companies went out of business. There was a massive recession. But, you know, struggled through it, continued to land on my feet, uh, landed a job at AOL doing some UX design, became a UX manager at a company called Web Trends in Portland, Oregon, uh, and then ended up at a company in New York City, back in New York City, at a company called The Ladders, managing a UX team and a design team. And so we're kind of back to, back to sort of 2008. And at that point in my life, I had clawed my way up to the middle, right? I'd, I'd fought for 10 plus years to become a middle manager at that point. And I was making a decent salary and I had a good job and I had the two kids and the wife and the house and the whole thing. And I wake up on my 35th birthday and I'm in a complete panic at this point because it dawns on me that there are these hordes of youths, <laughs> these young people that were ultimately coming after my job, right? All of these uh, young designers coming out of school that were uh, better designers than me. They were faster than me. They were smarter than me. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, could, you know, could produce better, ultimately better designs than me. And most importantly, they were cheaper than me as well, which was a big realization for me that if I kept progressing in the direction that I was headed, I was going to become increasingly more expensive and increasingly more difficult to hire and employ. And that was really scary for me because of my kids and my family and the house and the cars and all of that kind of stuff. And so on the morning of my 35th birthday, I made a resolution and it was a fairly significant resolution that changed really the trajectory of my life. And, and I started kind of writing it down in this book. This was the resolution, right? The resolution was this. Um, I was no longer going to look for jobs, right? This, this idea of chasing the next job, the next progression, the next manager gig, the next group product management gig, the next CPO or chief product officer gig. Um, and instead, jobs were going to look for me. I was going to create the kind of, uh, the kind of platform that allows work to find me rather than me finding work, right? Which is like this crazy epiphany, like, oh my God, right? Uh, let's, uh, that sounds amazing, Jeff, right? Let's do that. But um, the reality <laughs> is that as mind-blowing as that was, there are some really key questions to think about when you declare this resolution, right? That I'm not looking for work anymore, but work is gonna find me. And the questions are, are pretty basic, right? First of all, uh, does anyone know who I am? <laughs> like, why would anyone even come looking for me in the first place, right? Um, uh, you know, is there something that I can offer them of value? Um, how would they find me, right? And then ultimately, um, what kind of work do I want to find me, right? These are a lot of big questions to ask, right? Does anybody know me? Why would they look for me? Where would they find me? And then if they're finding me, is it the kind of work that I want to do? right? Is it product management work? Is it design work? Is it leadership work? Right? Uh, and if it's not, how do I change that? And so those were kind of the, like, you know, I had the panic, then I had the epiphany, and then I had these like four major doubts, these four major questions I had to think through. And so having made that resolution, I then spent the next 10 plus years building my platform, really working to resolve these questions and to bring that resolution to life. And over the last 10 plus years or so, um, what I've realized is that there are at least five qualities of you as a person to becoming forever employable and creating this sort of the agility of your career that allows you to bounce uh, bounce back no matter what's happening and the situation we have right now is very serious and is causing a lot of strife for a lot of folks, right? How do you create, what qualities do you need to, to embody to make sure that you can be agile in your career no matter what's happening? And then I also realized that there are, there, in my career at least, I've taken five very concrete steps to building this platform and to becoming forever employable. Um, and the bottom line, you add up all of these things and it boils down to this, is that you have to treat your career 
and your professional development as a product, right? So if you think about the products that you make today, right, you're solving a problem for somebody, you are delivering a product or a service that has value, and you have a target audience, and you have a very specific set of success criteria, outcomes, changes in behavior that you'd like to see if you're delivering something of value. How do you take those same ideas and treat, and, and treat uh, your career and your professional development in the same way? How do you think of it as a product? So I'm going to go through very, very quickly the, the five qualities to becoming forever un unemployable, forever unemployable, forever employable, forgive me, <laughs> and then the five steps that I took to get there, and then we'll kind of open it up to Q&A. So um, let's go through that. So there's five qualities that I've found that have been successful for me to becoming forever employable. And I'll show you some examples of my life that um, at first maybe didn't seem like they were embodying these qualities, but in retrospect, in hindsight, I can tell that this is what it was. And these are the five qualities themselves. So there's, there's uh, entrepreneurialism. So can you be entrepreneurial about yourself? Having a level of self-confidence to put new ideas out there, learning continuously, improving continuously, and then being able and willing to, to reinvent based on the facts on the ground. And if this sounds familiar to you, right, this is agile, right? This is agility more than anything. Um, but instead of focusing on products, you're focusing on your career, on your professional development, on your growth, on your safety net, on the ability to stay forever employable. Let me show you some examples from my, my experience for each one of these qualities, right? So if we start uh, with entrepreneurialism, right? I never thought of myself uh, as an entrepreneur, right? I've always been the, kind of the, the execution guy, not the ideas guy. Um, but as you're starting to think about what you're offering to the world, right? Um, you start to think about what's your value proposition, right? What are the competitive advantages that you have over others? Who's your target market? What problem are you solving? And how do you find product market fit in a long-term sustainable way? And my guess is there have been times in your career where you've done that. You know, when I played music, um, I never thought of that as a startup or being an entrepreneur, but that's exactly what it was. It was me and, and in this case, three or four other guys who had a dream. We had a vision about a product or a service that we wanted to give. In this case, it was our music. And we went on this crazy journey trying to bring other people with us, investing in it, not sleeping, not eating, um, and then trying to make it work, right? So my guess is that there, even if you don't consider yourself an entrepreneur, you've probably done some, some entrepreneurial things. And so that's really helpful in thinking about your career this way. Um, Self-confidence, right? The really interesting thing here is that when you set out to build a platform for yourself, one of the challenges you might come across is um, everything's already been said everything's already been done, right? What am I gonna talk about, about product management, right? Every single book's been written, every medium hot take has been written. But the reality is, is that you've gotta be confident in your experience, your specific experience, your personal experience has value, your knowledge has value, and no one has your story, right? And so you take that leap of faith and you kind of see what happens and you grow and you learn from it, right? As, uh, for example, I, uh, I joined the circus, um, when I graduated from university for six months, right? It, it was stupid. It was crazy. It didn't feel like the best idea, but I took this leap of faith. I was, like, I was confident I could be successful there, and I was, and I learned a ton, and that's shaped my story, and it's built this level of confidence in me to take bigger risks over time. So, like, what have you done in the past to drive self-confidence? Um, Continuous learning, right? This is the key. The way that we stay relevant in product management is by reading, by doing these meetups, by speaking with others and engaging in the community and experimenting and trying new things. So you hear a new idea, you read a new book, you, you, you uh, um, see a good talk, and then you try it and you see how it improves your business and if it improves, I'm sorry, your ways of working. And if it improves your ways of working, that builds your story and you can share that. For me, I've been sharing for years the impact that this particular book has had on my life and how it's changed my trajectory moving forward. Um, improvement, right? The learnings that you choose to implement um, will continue to drive and make you better, right? 
how do you continue to get to get better? Even if you see some success, how do you continue to improve? You know, Dragos was mentioning earlier that um, the last time we saw each other was in Paris um, doing a workshop with Jeff Patton. That's how I get smarter. I pick good people to collaborate with, good people to teach with, to work together with them so that I can get smarter and continuously improve the things that I offer, right? To me, that's a quality of becoming forever employable. And then lastly, really thinking through how you take the things that you've already done that have gotten you here and use them to get you there, right? How will you get from here to there, right? Recently, I published this piece in Harvard Business Review, their, their online blog, right? This is taking the content that we've been talking about in product management for years and applying it to non-product teams, HR and finance and so forth. The conversation we're having today is reinvention. It's taking those same ideas and applying them to your career and to professional growth and development. And so for me, those are the five qualities that you need to embody to become forever employable. Um, if we were to take a look at kind of what I've done in the last decade plus to build this platform, there are at least five concrete steps that I've done, and I'll share those with you, and then we'll do Q and A. Um, the five steps, just to give them to you up front, um, are this: these. Um, so first of all, you're going to plant a flag, and I'll tell you what that is in just a second. We're then going to learn how to tell our story. Once you start telling that story, new ideas, new opportunities show up. You have to follow the new path. As you follow the new path, you get better at teaching your ideas. And then lastly, giving it all away. Let me show you what I mean by all of these. So uh, step one, planting a flag. Right? Planting a flag is saying, look, I'm going to own this piece of content, right? I'm going to say, like, this is what I'm good at, product management. But not just product management. It's going to be product management for the Internet of Things or product management for the telco industry or for uh, electronic medical records or whatever it is or product Product management for uh, entry-level product managers, right? You're, you're going to plant a flag that says, this is where I'm going to actually have uh, an impact and I'm going to try to tell my story and where I have passion and experience. And eventually, you kind of become synonymous with that. So if I'm going to put, you know, put, put a name up on the screen. I say Eric Reese. Eric Reese planted his flag squarely in the lean startup, right? That's what Eric Reese did. Um, Jake Knapp, right? What flag did he plant, Right. Sprints, design sprints, right? Completely redefine that. Um, you know, our fearless guru there, Marty Kagan, right? Marty Kagan planted his flag on uh, product management, and he's, you know, scaled that and grown that over the years. For me, it was Agile and UX, and it came about because I was solving this problem in real time with my team 10, 12 years ago. And we used that to build... Uh, agile UX, lean UX, and so forth, and moving forward. So planting your flag is the first step, identifying what you want to talk about. The second step is telling your story, right? So now that you said, look, I'm going to talk about um, agile and UX together or product management for the healthcare industry, now I've got to tell my story, right? And the goal is to become a storyteller to anyone uh, who will listen everywhere all the time, right? And as you do that, the quality of your storytelling goes up and the scope and the reach that you have as a storyteller goes up as well. This is the one of the first talks I ever gave on UX and Agile. This is August 12th, 2010. It was called Beyond Staggered Sprints. You could probably find a recording of it somewhere. Uh, a month later, in Paris, no less, I gave my first talk ever on Lean UX. It was two and a half years after my 35th birthday, so it took some time to get there. And this talk was actually called Lean IA, Lean Information Architecture. It evolved into Lean UX over time. All right. And as, as we kind of move this forward, right, things start to get bigger, the reach starts to get bigger, the storytelling starts to get bigger. And in March of 2011, I'm talking about Lean UX and Smashing Magazine. Now a million people have read it. And then it gets into talks and various forums and so forth, right? All the different places that, uh, that you can tell your story. And anywhere that anyone will listen is a good place to tell your story, right? As long as you've got an audience there. And then, frankly, you know, you can come up with Lean UX the musical <laughs> if you wanted to as well. We, did, we stopped short of this, but, you know. 
right? You could do Lean UX the musical if you wanted to, right? But the point is, is that you start to tell your story and it starts to grow. And if you think about storytelling, the question really becomes, well, okay, well, then why, does my, why did my story resonate, right? Why did Lean UX kind of grow and become a thing? And it's because it solved a real problem. Many people have had, uh, I actually had real experience solving that problem, so it was authentic, right? Uh, I shared wins and losses. So it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm so awesome. I've solved this. You got to do what I did. It's like, oh my God, this is really hard. We tried a million different ways and failed. And here's one thing that worked for us, right? And when that one thing worked, I was super specific about it. Take these six steps and do that. And that really helps to build that authentic connection. So that's step two is telling your story. Uh, step three, as you tell your story, a new path will emerge. Inevitably, as you amplify your message, others will come up with, join you on your, uh, in telling that story and new paths will emerge. And this becomes really interesting as you're developing your career trajectory and your employability, because I was a designer and a design manager as this thing was coming up. And as I was becoming kind of more involved in the Lean UX story, I was doing less and less design work which is a real catch 22, right? I'm building this platform and I'm doing less of the thing that has made me successful to date and those skills are atrophying, right? It's super scary, right? This is, this is basically what I'm doing, right? I'm flying around the world, uh, giving talks and teaching workshops and not doing design work, which is really interesting, right? And so you kind of think about how to let the old paths go and the new paths show up. And one of the new paths that came up is that, book publishers go to conferences and they look to see who's talking about the latest topics. And as Lean UX was coming up and I was speaking about it at events, I started getting offered uh, a book. I got offered a book deal, right? And this is what I got uh, placed in front of me as a new path to follow uh, instead of kind of continuing on this design expert kind of path. And I was super excited about it. And um, I decided to follow this new path. I signed this uh, contract to, to write Lean UX, except there was one really big problem <laughs> with signing that contract is that I didn't know how to write a book. Um, I'd never written more than, I don't know, 750 words. And now I'm on the hook for 50,000 words in six months. That make 50,000 words, that makes sense together, right? And so I didn't know how to write this book, but this is the thing, right? A new path shows up, right? And so you could call me lucky. And yes, I'm absolutely lucky and privileged in a lot of ways, but I was prepared to take advantage of these opportunities, right? These new paths show up and I said, okay, I'll take it, right? Self-confidence, entrepreneurialism, right? Why not? Let's jump into that. And look, I didn't know how to write a book. It took me... To be very honest with you, when we come when it came to Lean UX, two years to write that book, three different editors, and four full complete manuscripts before O'Reilly accepted it for publication. I wrote that book four times the first time, which sounds awful. And it was. It was brutal, honestly. Getting like those manuscripts just torn to shreds every time was brutal. But it provided a tremendous opportunity because it let me keep telling my story and get people excited about this content coming out as I was learning how to write a book, right? And then finally, 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 March 11th, 2013, it's a full five years, right? After my 35th birthday, that Lean UX comes out, right? So it takes time to build this platform. So that's, but, but the paths emerge and we follow them. Two more steps and then we'll wrap this up and I'll do your Q and A. Teaching has become my main profession. This is what I do. I teach my experience, I consult, and then I take what I learn out of my consulting work and I teach other people from it. And I found it to be one of the most effective ways to get better at telling your story and to be more effective at building that flat platform and having those jobs start to find you. And there's all kinds of opportunities for you to teach. You know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know here, right? A lot of workshops and conferences, webinars and podcasts. Every single one of these is an opportunity to tell your story and to teach your material, to practice how to, how to be more effective, to tell a better joke, to land a better metaphor, whatever it is. I say yes to almost everything. 
right? Whether it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a webinar or a podcast or whatever it is, because I see it as a great opportunity to practice telling my story and to practice teaching. Um, and so that's really important, but I, I'll do a quick deep dive. Workshops is where I spend a lot of my time. And, um, and, and just, to, just as you think about workshops, again, um, workshops are a great way to exercise your idea. Again, get better at your storytelling. You make some money at workshops, which is nice. You generate leads for other business. Hey, uh, I, t- I teach something in a public workshop. Somebody brings me in to teach this in house. And then ultimately it starts to build all these new opportunities. And so teaching has been the key thing. In fact, it's one of the most delightful realizations I've made over the last couple of years is that I've become a teacher that I like it and uh, I'm pretty good at it, which I had no idea. Right. I mean, I, I never thought I'd grow up to be a teacher, which is kind of what I'm doing today. OK, last step. And I know I'm moving through this really quickly, but I want to leave lots of time for questions. OK, last step is to give it all away. This feels unintuitive. I've worked so hard to gain my experience and my expertise, and I'm just going to give it away for free. And the answer is yes, you're going to give it away for free. You're going to give it all away. You're going to make your work accessible and findable. If you go to my website today, my blog posts are there, they're free. Links to all the podcasts and webinars I've done are there, are free. Videos of my keynotes are there, they're free. Guess what? People still hire me to give those talks, right? The more you give out to the community, the more comes back. There's a nice reciprocal uh, uh, flow there and it feels good. It feels good to give back to the community. It feels good to build your community locally and improve your materials. So start locally, start in Paris, start in Stockholm, start in Singapore, and then you can grow from there. So kind of giving all this stuff away as much as you can. Um, A few things to remember as I wrap this up, Um, staying relevant and building this kind of forever employability means staying active. You've got to participate in the conversation. You've got to participate in the discourse of your discipline, in your industry, in your domain. As you're thinking about evolving your story, the cycle that I've, that's worked for me um, has been kind of this two year cycle, right? So one of the things I've been uh, interested in, in moving the conversation towards is how do we bring agility and product thinking to human resources, to HR? And I've been working on that for the last couple of years and I'm starting to see some traction there now. Um, and then a couple of caveats here. This is just my story. There are lots of other options and lots of other ways to get there. Uh, I've been asked a lot over the years how I've built the platform that I have. And so this is kind of me sharing that story. And there's a lot of more details in the book. And the thing that always sticks with me, and there's a lot of good, a lot of good Bezos quotes, um, but I really like this one. This is basically what he talks about is people always ask him kind of, hey, what's going to be different in the future? What should we build, be building for in the future? And he always says, what's not going to be different in the future, right? What's going to be true for the long term? What are people always going to need? What are they always going to do? What are they always going to ask for, right? And if we can structure our offerings around those things that are never going to change, we stay forever employable, right? And so with that, um, I'll, I'll wrap this up. I'll just say thank you. Um, I'll, I'll let you know that if you go to foreveremployable.com or my website, uh, there's a lot more info on the book. There is, uh, look, that transitioned all on its own. I'm going to move that back one slide really quick. Um, uh, and uh, the Kindle pre-order is up now on Amazon. So if you want to order it on, pre-order it on Kindle, you can go to Amazon and find it there as well. Cool. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to drop out of presentation mode and back to Zoom. And if you've got questions, there's already a few coming in uh, in the uh, Q&A module. Please drop your questions in the Q&A module. And then I think Dragos and I are going to do a little banter back and forth here um, and go through your questions uh, with that. Okay, so don't hesitate. And again, you can ask me questions about the stuff in the book. You can ask me questions about Lean UX, Sense and Respond, product management, whatever you want to talk about, Agile, that type of thing. Sound good? I hope so. Take that as a yeah, yes. Jeff. We already have three questions in the Q and A module. Do you see them? I do see them. Okay, let's go through the first one. Simon is asking, "Do you have this storytelling skill from the day one?" <laughs> um, so uh, it's interesting. You know, uh, 
my, my father fancies himself a storyteller. But if you ask anybody in my family, um, my, my father is a, is a long-winded storyteller. <laughs> and so um, maybe there's some of that in my DNA <laughs> to, to be uh, uh, active, to, to ultimately become a storyteller. But I have to admit that no, uh, I, I, I don't think I had it from day one. I think, um, look, I, I'm comfortable on stage in front of people because I played in bands for 10 years or more, right? So I've been, I've been in front of crowd, crowds of all sizes kind of doing my own thing. Um, but telling the story is practice. It's writing, it's rehearsal, it's knowing your material cold, you know, knowing it in your sleep. And um, no, I, I don't think I was good at it at first. In fact, if I, I probably go back and look for videos of myself from 10 years ago and probably be terrified, mortified of what I would actually see. And so um, uh, I think it's something you develop and you practice and you get better at. And then you get to a point where it's, it's second nature. And that's really when it becomes, to me, when it becomes the most fun because it allows you to sort of react to the room. It allows you to react to uh, current events. It allows you to react to uh, any kind of technical challenges. So for example, I, I remember I was on stage once at CraftConf in Budapest in front of 2,000 people telling, uh, giving a talk about uh, product discovery or Lean UX or something. And, uh, and the presentation just completely crapped out, right, in front of 2,000 people. But I'd been doing this for a while. I knew the material. I knew my story. And you kind of let it go. You, you kind of let the technical uh, glitches go. And it gives you that confidence to just kind of keep talking about it. And to me, um, that's one of the most empowering things. You get good at storytelling through practice. And that really relieves the stress of a lot of the other things. So it's a learned thing. Okay, uh, next question. You were talking about sharing not just successes, but also failures. So the question is, what are some of your failures on your path to oh. becoming forever employable? Uh, we don't have enough time. There's <laughs> 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 only about 25 minutes left in the talk. Um, man, I have, uh, I have tried a lot of things that didn't work out. I mean, uh, so, so first of all, I, I told you about sort of... Uh, Lean UX, um, writing that manuscript four times. And honestly, I didn't think I was going to get a fourth attempt at it. After two years, 18 months, and three failed manuscripts, I thought O'Reilly was going to fire me. So that, that was a big one for us. Um, building the building, look, Lean UX came from experience, right? Came from practicing Agile and UX and product management together in, in the same place. We failed miserably at that for a while. And even after I thought that we had nailed it, my team didn't think we had nailed it. My team thought that we were uh, completely broken and they let me know that diagram that I showed you in the presentation earlier, that was my team letting me know that I had failed. Um, I think that over the years um, I have um, made some career decisions that like taking jobs, that I thought were the right jobs to take because of either the position that was offered to me or to be perfectly honest with you, the salary that was offered to me. And I see a couple of those moves in my career as setbacks. I was sort of blinded by, by money and title rather than is this gonna help me learn? Is this gonna help me progress to the next thing? And I actually think it accelerated my path towards that panic moment on the morning of my 35th birthday because um because you know that's when i was like well the next step up is going to require a salary bump and no one's getting paid that kind of money in in ux or product management or design leadership or that type of thing um, so i think that there's, there's definitely a couple of mistakes there and choosing choosing positions uh that weren't exactly there uh the right ones um you know made some uh some decisions with some, some poor partnerships over the years. And so um, when I relocated uh, to Europe about three years ago, I was concerned that uh, 
I couldn't sustain my business here. I mean, I've, I've been working about 50% outside of the U.S. anyway, but I was concerned that my business wasn't sustainable here by myself. And so I ended up choosing a couple of partners out of haste and kind of this, this paranoia that I'd need that kind of support and local support and ended up choosing a couple of poor partners there, which set me back a little bit. And so there's, there's tons and tons of learning there from some, some poor decisions or uh, poor decision making, um, that type of thing. So a few, few things there. Thanks. Uh, Dan is asking, what is the biggest challenge you faced when you decide to launch your own platform to become forever employable? Yeah, so this is so, um, the biggest challenge is coming up with that first, that planting your flag, right? That what am I going to talk about, right? Uh, it's 2020, it's 2020, right? We're in product management. Um, what can I say about product management that hasn't already been said by a thousand other people a thousand different ways, right? To me, I think that that is the overwhelming challenge that most people face in starting to build a platform um, for themselves. Uh, and for me, it was the same. I, I looked back, I tried to find the earliest blog post I'd ever public, publicly facing blog post I'd ever written. And the earliest one I could find was from 2003. So 17 years ago. And it was a comparison article comparing uh, wireframes made in Visio with wireframes made in HTML. That was the article, like comparing HTML versus Visio wireframes. Um, in 2003, every single article about wireframes had already been written. <laughs> and that was 17 years ago. But you know what? I said, look, this is the thing I know, and this is my experience, and so I'm going to put this out there. And, uh, and I'm going to see if it resonates. I'm going to see if it sticks. Now, remember, I didn't double down on I'm going to be the wireframes guy, right? Like, I just said, look, I'm going to put this out there and see if it resonates and see what kind of traction it gets and see if people like it and what kind of feedback I get. And if that feedback is positive, maybe I'll do another piece about that and then another piece about that and scale my levels of investment. Think about this exactly like... Um, uh, you know, build, measure, learn, or like kind of a lean startup approach or, you know, incremental funding um, based on evidence-based uh, evidence based decision-making, right? I'm going to put um, a tweet out there and see if it resonates. If the tweet resonates or a couple of tweets resonate. I'm going to invest in um, writing a 500-word blog post. Let's see if that catches on. If that catches on, maybe I'll invest in a 1,000-word medium piece. 30 minute talk. And if that goes well, like maybe I'll invest in making it into an online course or a book or whatever it is, right? And so, but it's that first step of finding the thing that I think is, was the most difficult for me ultimately. And I tried a bunch of different things until in 2008, I finally caught that Agile and UX wave kind of on the way up. And so that was the biggest thing. There's a quick, um, and before we move on to the next question, I, I wanted to, um, just a quick side note here. Everything I've been talking about makes it sound like I'm advocating for uh, creating a consultancy or self-employment platform for yourself. And, and I'm certainly doing that, but it is not the only thing I'm advocating for. I do want to make it perfectly clear that the same tactics and the same practices that we've been talking about here for the last 45 minutes um, can be applied if you're an in-house employee at a company and you'd like to stay in-house. Not everybody wants to be self-employed. Not everybody wants to be a consultant. The same thing can work for you there as well. And in my opinion, it's, it's a win-win for you and your company. Right? So you're creating this platform for yourself and you're saying, look, I work for uh, Deutsche Bank, right? Whatever, like wherever you work, right? So, I, but so, so every time I'm out there talking about good practices, interesting ideas, offering new value to the community, right? The Deutsche Bank brand is being associated with that. That's great for hiring. That's great for attracting talent. That's great for building up the, um, the, the 
the, well, the brand for the bank, right? So in theory, this is a mutually beneficial uh, engagement as well. There will be organizations that won't love this, right? But uh, I do believe that this is beneficial for everybody. Think about it, like companies like Microsoft, for example, for a long time have had this evangelist, developer evangelist position. That's exactly what we're talking about here, right? Except making that sort of uh, access available to anybody who wants to within the organization. They don't necessarily have to have the job title evangelist. Cool. Just a little side note there, just to, to make that perfectly clear. Thanks. Um, let's take another question from Jean-Claude, who's asking, uh, currently, what are your main sources of inspiration? What are my main sources of inspiration? Um, the thing that's really interesting to me right now, so given the realities that we're facing with COVID-19 at the moment, um, I am in awe of the massive pivoting that I'm seeing across industries. So this is everything from pivoting your, uh, your manufacturing business to produce things that the world needs right now and, and that are in short supply, ventilators, masks, right, uh, PPE, right, that type of thing. Um, but also pivoting your business to survive this downturn. Um, obviously, everything's moving online, right? We're here today in the middle of the day having a meetup where normally we'd be meeting in person in Paris about this. Um, but there's really interesting things about taking experiences and bringing them online, um, uh, learning and bringing it online, um, watching uh, so my kids. I point it this way because my kids are out that door and they're in school right now, right? They're, they're in virtual school. Now, those two little cute little girls you saw in that first slide, they're teenagers now. Uh, and what's fascinating about their school is that their school, you know, it's a nice school. They've got good technology. Everyone's got computers, that type of thing. But they didn't know how to do virtual school. And they basically had to learn over the course of four days, like from the moment they shut schools down here to the moment that virtual, virtual school started was four days. And they got up and running. And the first week was rough. Right? It was their MVP. But they shipped it because they had to. And now they're fixing it in production right? Every week it gets better. Every week they solicit feedback from the kids, from the parents, from the teachers. Every week the tools change, right? To me, that's inspiring, right? And seeing that, that innovation and that, um, that continuous learning and improvement, that agility is, is inspiring uh, to me. And it's pushing me to rethink how I deliver what I do in a more compelling way, especially in the realities that we face now and, and, you know, whatever normal will be when this, when this ends, right? Who knows what that will be as well. Okay. Let's take the Elodie's question who is asking if you had some, you known some boredom or disillusionment to you during your career. And if so, how do you dealt with it? Uh, um, yeah. So this is the interesting thing. Um, there is, there is comfort in boredom. <laughs> um, and what, what do I mean by that? I mean that there is, there is comfort in familiarity. There's comfort in being a known entity. There's comfort in no surprises, right? And there is comfort in, and that becomes a bit boring and predictable, right? In my career, and look, and this is just me, I'm, I'm telling you my story, right? And I know that not everybody's like this, but in, in my career, whenever I've started to get too comfortable, I've started to get bored and disillusioned, like you said, I, I felt like I've stagnated and that I'm not learning or improving or getting better, which is a drive for me. I, I always want to, I want to improve and get smarter at, at a lot of different things. Um, and so for me, that's always an indication that it's time to move on. It's time for the next thing, the next job, the next piece of content, the next idea, the next attempt. Now, the, the, the risk here, and this is where the entrepreneurialism and the self-confidence comes in, is that you're going to throw yourself into a situation where you're uncomfortable. That will definitely break the boredom and the disillusionment right away. You won't have time for it because you're just sort of learning how to swim in these new waters. 
right? And so for me, it, it, it's step from, from the day, really from the day I joined the circus, um, where I kind of threw myself in that bizarro world for six months and, and survived and came out better on the other end. Um, when I get, it, it, as I think about my career, um, whenever I've gotten bored or disillusioned, I've changed, right? I've changed jobs and, and, or changed topics or moved forward. So for example, and uh, I've been teaching Lean UX for, gosh, I mean, 12 years, roughly, right? Teaching some version of Lean UX for 12 years. I'm not bored with it, right? But the con I want to have bigger conversations. And so, you know, after Lean UX, we wrote Sense and Respond as a business book for managers to, and leaders to try to have a bigger conversation about bringing uh, digital transformation and agility to the business, not just to product development and design. Um, and that's been, that's been really interesting, right? Writing that book was uncomfortable. Delivering that content was initially uncomfortable. Um, sitting in boardrooms, right? With, for companies that have 200,000 employees is freaking terrifying. <laughs> You're not going to be bored when you're sitting in a room with the, you know, the, the, with the board of a company that employs 200,000 people and you're giving them advice, right? Um, to me, that's how I've dealt with it, um, is to kind of throw myself into the next thing and then build the next platform. And I remember what I said in the talk, I found that cycle to be at least kind of a couple of years. So as you start to kind of sense that boredom and that disillusionment, start to test new paths and then kind of go with the ones that resonate with whoever you're trying to talk to. Let's take a question from Anne-Sophie, who is asking, uh, which advice would you give to someone who is afraid of failure? <laughs> um, uh, that's, yeah, look, I mean, this is, this is I, think we're, I think to some extent or another, we're all afraid of failure. So this kind of comes back to treating yourself like your product, right? If you think about your product, right? Um, while most organizations uh, uh, will sort of build something and ship it and hope that it works, we know better, right? As modern product managers, we know that um, you should run experiments and take small risks. That way, if you get it wrong, it hurts less. The same thing can be applied to your self to yourself your growth your development your career that type of thing so for example you want to make a, a career change or you want to change companies right but you're afraid that this next gig will actually be worse than your current gig and uh and you won't succeed you'll fail you'll, you'll get fired or whatever it is and you'll end up with nothing one of the things that i did and again this is this is it's not easy um but i did a lot of moonlighting gigs um, over the years. So when I was employed full time in house, I would uh, take side jobs. And um, I would uh, try different types of work in the evenings and on the weekends or whatever it is to see if this is something that I wanted to do. Right? And I reduced the risk of jumping to that next job or that next way of working. So how can you reduce the risk of your, the thing that you're afraid will fail, right? Whatever that is, how do you reduce the risk? And then how do you run experiments? Again, I'll share another example from my life. Um, you see my daughters, we've talked about it, married, right? Um, seven years ago, we wanted to move to Europe. Um, we didn't know where to go. We didn't know where we would be happy. We love Europe, <laughs> right? <laughs> Europe can be a thousand different cities, right? Where do we go? Um, and so we didn't want that to fail because that was going to be a big move for us, taking the kids out of school, moving them to a new school, a new country, a new language. And so we ran experiments, right? We tested different cities in Europe over the years. We took the kids in the summer for a month-long uh, holiday in various cities. We got an Airbnb in a neighborhood and we lived in, that, lived in that neighborhood for a month in the summer. Now look, ideal circumstances, right? It's summer, the weather's gonna be good, there's no school. I was working, because I could work you know, from anywhere, um, but generally speaking, this, this would be the ideal situation. And if we didn't love it under ideal conditions, we definitely weren't going to love it under crappy conditions. And so we ended up trying five different cities uh, over the course of four years, and then decided on, on Barcelona ultimately. 
and moved, right? So how do you take that big idea that you have and condense it into a tiny test? If that tiny test fails, you know, you didn't lose much, but you're building evidence for your next decision, right? Great. Um, Clément has a great question. He's talking about the rise of the product management in France as a challenge for a lot of companies because it requires a change of mindset in the whole company. It can't only be done only on the PM levels. So what would be your advice is to manage this cultural, cultural change? Yeah, cultural change is really hard, right? And this is, this is like, you're not just trying to change uh, yourself or your team, you're trying to change the whole organization. Um, there's, a, there's a reason why um, people push back against big changes. And, and it's exactly the conversation we just had. Uh, they're afraid it's going to fail and they're afraid they'll get blamed for it and there'll be some kind of fallout that hurts them some way financially, in their job, in their uh, reputation, whatever it is, right? And the culture change are the same thing. Um, the business that we are in gives us the opportunity to teach the organization uh, risk management and, and, and more than risk management, risk mitigation, right? So culture, cultural change is scary because if everyone's got to change and work this new way, what does that mean for everybody else? What does that mean for the way that we pay people? What does that mean for the way that we reward people? Um, and if you have to change that, what do we do with the people who have been playing by the rules for five, 10 years? And now we're saying, okay, now everything's different. So you got to play by new rules. That's not fair, is it? And so uh, the way that you start to push cultural change, again, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record on this, is to reduce the risk of that change. How do you reduce the risk of that change and, and build evidence that it's a better, it's a better way of, of working is you run an experiment. So you take a microcosm of the organization and you, and, and you create a small pilot effort, right? So a test, an experiment, in this case, a culture and a process experiment. We take six people for eight weeks or five people for 12 weeks or whatever it is, and we empower them within a very safe, psychologically safe time box to create uh, and to practice these new ways of working. And along the way, they are collecting evidence about what's going to work well inside this organization and what's not going to work well. As they go through that process, they're being very transparent, just like we've been talking about here today, is we're sharing back, hey, we tried this and it didn't work. Hey, we tried this and it did work, right? And so by the end of that eight or 12 week cycle, that team has figured out two things. They figured out these new ways of working and they figured out these new ways of working within the context of your company, which is going to be different than my company or anybody else's company. And they've collected evidence that says, this is a better way of working. And when you present that to the leaders of an organization, you're saying, look, based on this experiment, we've got the data and the evidence to suggest that this new way of working will improve our productivity by X, increase customer satisfaction by Y, and reduce our attrition by Z. You're making a much more compelling case for the change. Right? And you can scale that change incrementally, right? Two pilot teams, five pilot teams, 10 pilot teams. Um, in an organization that at least believes in uh, evidence-based decision-making, test and learn type of practices, this should resonate. It doesn't always resonate, but it should resonate. So reduce the risk, run the experiment, collect the data, and then share that data back with the org to promote an extension of, of the, the change. Let's do one more, Dragos. Okay, we have time for one more. Uh, Sarah is asking how and when would you know that you should keep trying or just drop it and pivot? I think she's talking about when you're searching your thing, the thing that other ones, uh, the others want to buy. Yeah, uh, hi Sarah. Um, I, yeah, this is, the, and this, this is tough, right? When do you, when do you let these ideas go? Um, it's really difficult, especially when you're focusing on yourself, right? It's one thing to work, be working with a team and, 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 and a company and have a product that you, you might love, but it's not, it's not you, it's not your career. I think, look, there's a couple, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, 
setting clear success goals is helpful, right? So I will only continue pursuing this path if X, Y, and Z happen is helpful. Still difficult because if you get really close, right? If you say, look, if I get 100 subscribers to my YouTube channel by the end of the year, right? And you get 97, right? It's like, ah, it feels pretty good. I'm going to keep going, right? So, but setting clear goals, like, but if you get 27, right? That's a good indication that you might want to let it go. Um, the other thing too is, look, I have a circle of colleagues that I bounce ideas off of all the time. And when I'm doing something stupid, they tell me that it's stupid. When I'm pursuing something that's been going on for a while, or if I can't decide to move forward, I share, I share that with a circle, a trusted circle of colleagues, and I get that candid feedback. And it's really helpful. This is particularly helpful if you work, if you're self-employed, right? So if you're, if you're self-employed, um, it, it, it can get pretty lonely. Uh, this work at home thing is nothing new for me. <laughs> um, and so having that trusted circle of friends to bounce ideas off of and colleagues really helps to bring some objectivity to the conversation and helps you kind of refocus yourself on the things that are yielding better results. So those are at least two things that I would do to help move that forward as well. Cool. Uh, do we have time for one more or no? What do you think? Uh, I, I, could, I could do one. I could do one more. Let's do okay. one more. It's, Cameron is asking, um, okay, it's a close question, but you try to do it. Do you worry about not having frontline work to add to your future stories? Always. Uh, sorry, I'm just putting something in the chat so you guys can send me an email with your questions. Um, yeah, uh, I definitely worry about stagnating. Look, the good news is I've got, I've got um, uh, a good, you know, I've got a, a solid pipeline of consulting work. And the consulting work is where the stories come from. Uh, and I really enjoy it because I can teach and I can learn at the same time. I think that at some point, and this is, this is where I, you know, this is where I struggle a little bit. Um, uh, I, I never want to become an academic. And, and if you're an academic, this is not an insult in any way, shape, or form. For me, I want to be able to teach from my personal experience, right? I want to be, I want to say that I did this and it worked or it didn't work and here's what I learned. Because to me, that's a far more authentic story. So a significant amount of my effort is focused on generating that consulting work because that's how I learn as well. I teach and I learn at the same time. But I do worry about that. I worry about it all the time. And it's part of the reason that I continue to, 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 out, to reach out to communities, to different communities, to really try to gain a perspective on how people are doing things differently um, and, and to build that, uh, to build the stories from there. So yeah, I worry about it all the time. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. It was uh, very cool to have you with us today. Very insightful. Um, we have uh, some questions about uh, for, from those who came later. So we will share as soon as possible the, the video recording, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, can we share your slides too? I don't know if someone. Uh, yeah. You I'll, share it sure, somewhere. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll create a PDF, and if you want the slides, uh, just email me. Um, I, I just dropped my email in the chat. It's jeff at gothealth.co or just send me a note from my website and I'll send the slides. Um, and then if you didn't get your question answered and you still would like it answered, just email me as well and I'll get back to you as soon as I can.